The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the math whiz who built the modern world. You're part of this big thing. At a time when we barely knew how to use computers. Make sure that uh, they could depend on anything that you sent. How this hidden figure helped America into orbit. I always had to be, be my best. And paved the way for the GPS. I can just about see the complete circle. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this uh, Veterans Day. What? Not not Veterans President's Day. President's Day. Oh, yeah. This used to be George Washington. Now it's for all of them. But anyhow, <laughs> we're delighted to have you with us. And I want to tell you, we've got some interesting things coming up. We've got a woman who is the, well, as you say, the author, the founder of the GPS. Amazing, brilliant woman. And she's going to be talking about what she, she's doing, and I think you'll find it very interesting. We also have a remarkable healing. The doctors said this person was going to die, and instead of dying, they got healed, and you want to find out about that. We're going to be praying for you on this program. So it's going to be fun, and we're going to have a good time together. Well, I, I don't know. It's being called a bureaucratic coup, and top Justice Department officials have discussed using the 25th Amendment to remove the president. And Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein even talked about wearing a wire in the White House. These are top officials in the Justice Department. And Andrew McCabe, who's been uh, accused of lying uh, on several occasions and uh, is under investigation, uh, it's really a shocking, shocking thing uh, what they, they, they're doing. The Justice Department, the FBI, was rotten at the core. Unbelievable. I mean, if there's a good thing that's come out of all of this mayhem, I think it's seeing how much needs to be fixed and addressed in these various departments. It's well, that one particular, I mean, you've got uh, uh, Lisa Page and, and Strzok and these others saying, how are we going to uh, uh, keep Trump from being elected. I mean, this is terrible for FBI directors to do that. All right. Well, former acting FBI Director Andrew McCabe did make those claims in an interview last night. Now, one Senate Republican is ready to do whatever it takes to find out what really happened. CBN Washington correspondent Amber Strong reports. Senator Lindsey Graham says he's willing to issue subpoenas if that's what it takes to get to the bottom of what happened behind the scenes at the FBI following the firing of former director James Comey. I promise your viewers the following, that we will have a hearing about who's telling the truth. In his first sit-down interview since being fired from the FBI, former acting director Andrew McCabe told 60 Minutes that Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein was actively seeking ways to oust President Trump. A discussion of the 25th Amendment was, was simply Rod raised the issue and discussed it with me in the context of thinking about how many other cabinet officials might support such an effort. McCabe also saying Rosenstein suggested wearing a wire during his meetings with Mr. Trump. He said, I never get searched when I go into the White House. I could easily wear a recording device. They wouldn't know it was there. McCabe, who is releasing a book, says the DOJ had good reasons to be suspicious. If the president committed obstruction of justice, fired the director of the, of the FBI to negatively impact or to shut down our investigation of Russia's malign activity, you have to ask yourself, why would a president of the United States do that? President Trump reacting via Twitter, calling McCabe a disgrace. Graham says he wants to know more know about those discussions and anything denied. else going on behind the scenes the at the department. I do know there was a lot of monkey business about FISA warrants being issued against Carter Page, about dossiers coming from Russia that were unverified. Mr. Mueller is going to look at the Trump campaign. Now I'm going to do everything I can to get to the bottom of the Department of Justice. Fellow committee member Chris Coons agrees an investigation is warranted, but is cautious. Um, I suspect that once this is fully discussed, uh, it'll be clear that this was a brief or passing conversation that's been taken out of context, but it does deserve scrutiny. Now the Department of Justice calls McCabe's account factually incorrect, and Rosenstein denies taking part in any extended conversations about the 25th Amendment. Amber Strong, CBN News, Washington.
Well, you know, Ron Rosenstein was laughing about this whole thing that he was wearing a wire and so forth. But I tell you, that man, the whole idea of appointing a, a, this special counsel to investigate these things, this fusion GPS material, which was all phony, this Christopher Steele thing was all phony. And it was paid for by the Democrats. And instead of turning on Hillary Clinton to find out all the millions of dollars she and her husband got from Russian sources, they want to investigate, and they've been digging, 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 digging into some kind of Russian collusion. And after all this time, they haven't found it yet. But Rosenstein set up this uh, special counsel, and you say, why would anybody working for somebody betray their boss in a fashion like he did? He should have been fired a long time ago. He's offered to resign. I think the sooner he's out of there, the better off things will be. But it's rotten all the way through. So we've just confirmed now uh, a new attorney general uh, who has tremendous experience, who's highly respected in the uh, Justice Department, and hopefully they can get the bottom of this. But it has a black mark on that particular agency and on the FBI, which had enjoyed such high regard among the American people. The top of it has just been rotten. Well, in other news, Democrats are preparing a full court press against the president's declaration of a national emergency. John Jessup has more on that. That's right, Pat, and a top White House advisor says the president's prepared to veto any disapproval resolution passed by Congress. Since making his declaration Friday, opponents in Congress and the states are lining up to fight Trump's effort to fund the border wall with a national emergency. Mark Martin reports. President Trump looks to fund the border wall with defense and treasury funds, but it's not going to happen without a fight. Democrats are lining up to oppose the president's emergency declaration from multiple lawsuits to resolutions in both houses of Congress. I think there's enough people in the Senate who are concerned that what he's doing is robbing from the military and the DOD <clears throat> to uh, go build this wall. I could do the wall over a longer period of time. I didn't need to do this, but I'd rather do it much faster. Resolutions terminating a declaration could pass the House and Senate, given the number of Republicans who also oppose the declaration. A resolution the president would certainly veto, according to key staffers, and a lack of votes in the Senate for an override. He's going to protect his national emergency declaration guaranteed. Even supporters who agree there needs to be a wall say it won't be easy. It's going to be a slow process. It's going to go to the courts, but better to, to start that process so that we can ultimately get there than to not start it at all. California and other states are planning to sue in federal court along with the ACLU. He himself said it. He did not need to announce or declare a crisis. He did not have to call this an emergency. As for the funding coming from the National Defense, Acting Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan told reporters he's not sure the wall is a military necessity or how much funding the Pentagon would give toward it. Mark Martin, CBN News. Thanks, Mark. Iranian and Chinese hackers are stepping up their attacks on America's public and private sectors. According to a report in the New York Times citing anonymous officials, the Department of Homeland Security issued an emergency order last month after Iran targeted dozens of businesses and several government agencies. The Times says Iran's cyber offensive came as China launched a renewed effort to steal military secrets from U.S. contractors and trade information from tech companies. The Times reports that Boeing, General Electric Aviation, and T-Mobile were among the companies China targeted for industrial espionage. While the weeks-long political showdown in Venezuela is worsening that country's humanitarian crisis, the U.S. and dozens of other nations are calling for Nicolas Maduro to step down. Maduro not only refuses to budge, he's also blocking international relief from entering the country. Sunday, Florida Senator Marco Rubio flew to neighboring Colombia to put pressure on the Venezuelan strongman. CBN contributing correspondent Chuck Holton was there. As the tragedy that is Venezuela reaches new levels of misery, nobody's quite sure who's in charge of the country. Fifty nations now recognize Juan Guaido as the interim president, but one person in particular strongly disagrees. That's Nicolas Maduro, the man who's been running the country since 2013. But with more than three million Venezuelans having fled their homeland, and many of those left inside literally starving, here in the border town of Cucuta, Colombia, tensions along the border are coming to a head. 
American military aircraft have been arriving here over the past week, delivering tons of humanitarian aid intended to ease the suffering of these Venezuelans. But troops loyal to Nicolas Maduro have so far blocked the shipments from entering their country. Maduro has called the shipments unnecessary and a political stunt, but these Venezuelans beg to differ. We need help right now. You know, our people are there, you know, starving, you know, dying, just waiting for what? They can't waste any more time. We need help right away. Please help American people. We need you. We need you. You know, we beg your help. Over the weekend, a congressional delegation from the U.S. arrived at the border to see the situation, accompanied by the Colombian ambassador to the United States, Francisco Santos Calderon. Even though uh, the dictator is saying that this is a provocation, the only answer that we have for, uh, for him is that this is an act of love. This is an act of Christianity. This is an act that shows the moral compass of those who cannot stand by seeing the suffering of millions and millions of Venezuelans that come across this bridge dying of hunger, dying because of lack of medicine. Senator Marco Rubio from Florida was also in attendance. What is happening here today, what is happening in Venezuela is a man-made crisis of epic proportions, not caused by a natural disaster, but by a man-made one. A criminal regime that is willing to starve and kill its own people before it gives them power. But many of those attending Sunday worship services across this city are clinging to hope for change in Venezuela and praying for peace in the process. In Cucuta, Colombia, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Thanks, Chuck. Pat, back to you. Um, you know, folks, there comes a time that uh, the free nations can't stand idly by and watch the humanitarian crisis developing. This one man is an evil person. He is power hungry, and he is blocking the flow of humanitarian goods to feed his starving people medicine to take care of him, the sick and the dying in his country, and he refuses to let it come in. Now, what kind of a person is that? Well, he's the kind of person that needs to get taken out. And I, I do believe it's time for the military, first of all, we need everything that's possible to tell those military that if you come along, alongside now, we will not uh, convict you of war crimes, and the thieving that you have done will not go punished. We won't uh, hold you responsible for some of your acts, but you must turn now. The other thing would be that if you don't turn in the next couple of days, you're going to be uh, well, we, we will dispose of you in various ways. And I think the time has come for troops to go in and get the thing done. We can't let this just continue to fester and talk about, well, this is an act of Christianity and all this. Maduro is a monster. And he presides over the most uh, appalling uh, suffering that has come upon a prosperous nation. It was the wealthiest country in South America. It has one of the biggest deposits of uh, petroleum in the world. And there is no reason that that country should have fallen into the, tr the trouble it has fallen into. But that is what happens when you have socialism. It is extreme socialism. And now they have inflation in, in a, a measure that may be a million or two million percent. It's unprecedented. And I, th I really believe it's time to get some troops in there and get the thing over with. Well, we just can't keep... Uh, looking at suffering and saying, well, isn't that too bad? And, and maybe the people will rise up. They can't rise up against the guns and the bayonets of that uh, Venezuelan army. But we have a lot more sophisticated stuff than that, and it's time we start w working on it. And spy, by the way, speaking of cyber, the Chinese are stealing our stuff. We're stealing us blind. And we have at the NSA the most sophisticated cyber uh, forces of any country in the world. And it's time we turn them loose on China and let them understand what it's like to be up against a major power. John? Well, Pat, a series of storms moving across the country will bring plenty of snow and rain this week. This morning the, in uh, the Northeast, feeling remnants of a Sunday storm with up to four inches of snow in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Parts of Iowa, Wisconsin, and Illinois saw 8 to 10 inches of snow Sunday, causing multiple highway accidents. 
Tuesday, a new system is expected to bring snow to the Midwest and heavy rainfall with possible flash flooding in the Mississippi Valley. That followed by more snow Wednesday, a storm predicted to bring as much as six inches to north, northern Virginia and West Virginia. Pat, poor Punxsutawney Phil got it wrong. Well, we've got Joe Bastardi, our good friend from AccuWeather, will be here tomorrow. He has been so right about these things, and he's more fun to talk to. So he'll be with us <laughs> and uh, set us straight on what's happening. That's right. Don't want to talk to Punxsutawney <laughs> anymore. <laughs> what has happened to global warming? Well, they'll say there's climate change, you know. Well, anyhow, it's, it's going to be cold, ladies and gentlemen. We're not out of it yet. And the groundhog, I don't know the groundhog is a bad predictor of weather. <laughs> Well, up next, the shrinking Sea of Galilee. For the 25 years that I'm here, this is the lowest. Pray hard for rains. That's what we need, a lot of prayers. See what Israelis are doing to save this biblical body of water when we come back. The Sea of Galilee. That's where Jesus walked on water, where he calmed the storms, where he called Peter to be his disciple. But this historic body of water is in danger. Overpopulation and years of drought are causing it to shrink alarmingly. CBN Middle East correspondent Chris Mitchell is explaining what's happening. More than a million tourists visit the Sea of Galilee each year. But the biblical lake is shrinking after several years of drought. This is the same Sea of Galilee that Jesus walked on. From out on the lake, it may look like there's plenty of water, but in reality, it's a different situation. There are altogether 21 boats on the Sea of Galilee. And because the level of the water is so low, for example, in Genosar, instead of three piers, we use only one. Daniel Carmel owns two of those boats. He operates Sea of Galilee worship boats and takes Christian groups out on the lake for a unique worship experience. They don't know how is the Sea of Galilee when it's full. This is the, the lowest that I ever saw. Uh, 25 years that I'm here, this is the lowest. Israel's rainy season begins in late October and goes to mid-March. After that, it doesn't rain very much. This winter may have an above average rainfall, but it's still not enough. The lake is the main thing that characterizes, you know, our life here from every point of view. Although today, unfortunately, we cannot make our living from fishing. Uzi Velish was born in a kibbutz on the Sea of Galilee and has lived in the area since the 1930s. He's seen the lake at all different levels. When my first daughter was married, it was 93, it was very full. The wedding was on the lawn here in front of my house. You can see it, about 200 meters. Okay. It will come. Up to where the rocks. The rocks were put in there in the 70s to defend from, from the storm. You know, there was a storm, east storm, and the waves chopped the soil, so they built these rocks. He said trouble started when the British built a dam in 1932. The moment you stop the Jordan, beginning to control. But only in 64, they added the big pumps that delivered the water from the Sea of Galilee to the south or to the mid, middle of, the, of Israel. On top of that, Israel gives Jordan 50 million cubic meters of water as part of the 1994 peace agreement, and Jordan is asking for more. The lake has been low in the past and recovered, like 30 years ago when the receding waters revealed a hidden treasure. This boat is really completely unbelievable. Dubbed the Jesus boat, the fishing vessel is like one Jesus' disciples would have used. Found in the mud on the shore, it soon became a national sensation. That was really something. The whole state was a boat from 2,000 years ago. This is a, and with such a significance, you know, that really can be related to, to Jesus, you know. <laughs> Treasures aside, the Kinneret, as it's called in Hebrew, or the Sea of Galilee, used to be one of Israel's main sources of drinking water. Until not so long ago, uh, the Sea of Galilee was one of the three main natural sources that supplied water. Now it hardly supplies. Growing population, increasing demand, and a lack of rain have all contributed to the situation. The lake is more than 15 feet below the full line. 
A rainy winter would normally add about five and a half feet. Then it begins to evaporate again in the summer. Due to the length of the current drought, the Israeli Water Authority has stopped pumping into the main water system. We cut down the pumping there from about 400 million cubic meters per year to less than 30. And nevertheless, the level of the water of the Sea of Galilee continues going down. If the water level drops too low, the lake would become salty and eventually lost as a drinking source. That's why Israel tried a unique approach. Israel planned and started building water carriers that will bring water from desalination plants to the Sea of Galilee in order to keep the level of the water high enough in order not to lose the Sea of Galilee as a drinking water pond. Shore says they can't fill the lake completely with desalinated water because it would bring down the water quality. I do not think that you have another lake in the world that um, people fill it with uh, man-made water in order not to lose it. So uh, we'll be pioneers about that as well. Shore said once every 20 to 30 years, Israel gets enough rain to fully restore the Sea of Galilee in one season, but they can't count on it. In addition to not pumping water out and pumping desalinated water in, Carmel had this advice. Pray hard for rains. That's what we need, a lot of prayers. Pray for rains, even when you are here. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. What a treasure it would be if we, if we lose that Sea of Galilee. But I, I think somehow the Lord's going to give rain, as he always does. Yeah, every 20 or 30 years, they yeah. said it replenishes it. Well, may it be so. Well, <laughs> so. they've pulled so much out of it, and you know, that's the, that's the problem with these water sources. You know, we have these aquifers, for example, and, and they're, some of them go back a million years. And, and if we drain them out, I mean, the sources of water, I mean, the Ogallala aquifer, for example, in the heartland of our nation, very important water source. And you've got them uh, under the uh, uh, desert over there in North Africa, these uh, tremendous aquifers. But you drain them, they're all gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, coming up, meet the 88-year-old mathematician who paved the way for GPS. I never would have thought that I could sit in a car and, you know, <laughs> it says, turn left, turn right. No. Watch this hidden figure's remarkable rise from a country farm girl to a key player in the space race right after this. Well, you might not know her by name, but Gladys West has made an indelible impact on our world. In 1930, Gladys was born in Dinwiddie County, Virginia, to a farming family in a community of sharecroppers. Yet last year, she was inducted into the United States Air Force Hall of Fame. This woman's remarkable rise is a tribute to her hard work, unrelenting determination, and extraordinary ability to pursue excellence. Whether it's navigating jet airliners, providing directions to a new restaurant, or geotagging your social media pictures, few imagine the impact GPS would have on modern society, including 88-year-old Gladys West. I never would have thought that I could sit in a car and, you know, <laughs> it says, turn left, turn right, <laughs> no. <laughs> For 42 years, Gladys was employed by the U.S. Navy. As a mathematician, she would help lay the groundwork for many of the government's orbital satellite projects. That includes what became the Global Positioning System, or what we call GPS. We didn't do all the GPS stuff that's uh, for the car and all, and, you know, we, we didn't actually do that, but what we did was got the accuracy of where things were located all around the world and stuff in its, its database. Born in 1930, Gladys grew up on her family's farm just south of Richmond, Virginia, where she learned the value of hard work. And that would pay off for Gladys, who wanted more than what life on a country farm could offer. You could get a scholarship if you were the first or second in your high school graduating class. So right off, you know, <laughs> I was Johnny on the spot, yeah, doing all my work all the time. 
she finished at the top of her high school class, earning her a full scholarship to what was then called Virginia State College, a historically black school in Petersburg, Virginia. The teachers were encouraging me to major in math because they thought that I would be good. Again, Gladys finished at the top of her class and went on to complete her master's. In 1956, she accepted a job at the Naval Support Facility in Dahlgren, Virginia. The space race was just taking off, and computers were the wave of the future. It was really an excitement, you know. They promised us that they would teach us, you know, how to communicate with this computer and, and all this stuff, you know. So, I, and knowing me, I, I was ready to, <laughs> to, you know, to work hard with it. And work hard she did. With the success of the space program, NASA was beginning to place satellites into orbit. Gladys was tasked to help write and program code, needed to process the enormous amount of data coming in. You have a long equation in there, certain coefficients that go along with each term. You have to generate them, get, get them accurate and all. Our program encoded all those equations and we checked them out um, by hand cases and all. And they were passed on to the next level. The work was long and tedious. Every equation checked and rechecked for accuracy. You didn't want to cause anybody else in a hole up or any trouble about something that you had done that prevented them from, from making progress. So you want to have to make sure that uh, they could depend on anything that you sent. It was this tenacity and dedication that drew the attention of the fellow mathematician Ira West. The two dated for 18 months before getting married in 1957. She wasn't an easy catch, you know. Let me tell you, I had to work hard for that. <laughs> I always think of Ira, and I always tell him, I said, he played more than I did. Meanwhile, the civil rights movement was sweeping the country. Gladys and Ira wanted to show their support, but government employees weren't allowed to participate in public demonstrations. So the couple decided the best way to help was to change perceptions and work even harder. We just were pushing, 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 pushing. We couldn't uh, participate directly, but indirectly in the situation. That was another reason why I felt that I always had to be, be my best and I always uh, had to, like, be a role model. In the years that followed, they both continued their work for the Navy on numerous projects. In 1978, Gladys received a commendation for her work and was promoted to project manager of the CSAT Radar Altimetry Project, the first satellite that could collect data across the ocean's surface. It was always interesting. We were working with people and doing something that was important and that's going to be used by the government and all. You got to make sure <laughs> you're doing everything right because you're part of this big thing that's happening. As she always had, Gladys stayed true to herself, striving to be defined by her competence and not by the color of her skin. I think I was most happy when I got to the point that I could be independent and I could uh, troubleshoot big programs and be a help to the uh, analysts who had helped to generate uh, the program. When I could talk to them, you know, it's sort of like be a part and understand. Um, I think that was the best feeling I had. Even after retiring in 1998, Gladys stayed busy, completing her PhD in philosophy and writing her memoirs. For all of her accomplishments, commendations, and recognition she has received over her career, Gladys understands there is only one who she can credit for the direction her life has taken. I think everybody should have God in their li lives so they understand. And I can just about see the complete circle and I can go back and I can look and see what he did and where he put me and put it all along. And I was saying, it's just, it's just amazing that I didn't understand at the time exactly what was happening, but he was there and he was doing it.
What an incredibly gifted, lovely woman. Isn't that amazing? I mean, wow. your heart just sings when you see her career. Well, what genius. What, genius, you know, yes. We haven't begun to see what God can do. God's the author of wisdom, and yeah. he can touch somebody's mind like Gladys. Yeah. Wow, amazing to think she did all of that, for the most part, in her head. Yeah, <laughs> Without... but I mean, she's a farm girl from Dinwiddie County, Virginia, yeah. coming as a sharecropper and then rises to the heights that she did. Isn't well, that amazing? A commitment to excellence and hard work yeah. will get you a long way. She never stopped, but the, the yeah. genius that God had put in her mind. Okay. Well, right. time for some email. Let's okay, go. Okay, we're going to answer some of your questions. This is from Daniel, who says, In Acts 5.3, the Apostle Paul talks about the Holy Ghost. Why did Paul refer to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost? Is there a difference? Should I say Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit? You know, a lot of, a lot of preachers uh, had their sermons based on the fact it's just a translation. Uh, the whole word is pneuma, is spirit. Uh, it, it's, and, and, you know, back in the old English, they call that ghost, and it's not ghost, it's spirit. And uh, so there's no difference. And but I, I don't mean to take away some sermons from people who made their living <laughs> on it. But okay. All right. okay. This is Jane who says, Pat, should I change my church? I love our wonderful pastor, the people and the great messages, but the worship leader is awful. It's like watching a one man show. This guy likes to be in the spotlight and uses the worship time to strum his guitar until some of our older folks start to doze off. He doesn't sing any familiar songs. A number of us have talked to the pastor, but he hasn't changed anything. In my case, I get so angry trying to follow this show off that I can't can't worship. What should I do? Uh, I think what you might do is talk to the board of uh, your church and say, listen, this guy's got to go. But I, I, to me, it drives me nuts. They have these so-called worship sessions. They go on forever and ever and ever, and they never stop. And it's the same thing, what you're talking about. And uh, it's, 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 it's just, you know, when I was in seminary, I learned about how you build worship. And the idea is you build it up to some kind of a climax where you want people to get saved. You want them to, be, to give an offering. You want them to do something. But you just don't keep on and on and on and on. And they have that so-called worship time in churches. And listen, maybe I'm too old, but I, I think it's a, it's a pain in the neck. So could they, I agree with you. I don't know what to say, except <laughs> go to the elders of the church and say, listen, something's got to be done about this. Can you make a difference? All right. Okay, this is Tom who says, Exodus chapter 17, verse 16 says, The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Who are the descendants of Amalek? Well, the Amalekites were people who attacked Israel as they were coming out of Egypt. And they were sort of uh, uh, like jackals uh, waiting in, in ambush, and they'd strike at the Israelis from behind. And uh, that's when Saul was told to kill all the Amalekites. Uh, he didn't do it. You know, he, he left uh, some of them alive, you know, and, and the, the, some of those, they thought that later on that uh, well, when there was a decree that went out to kill the Jews back in Persia, that the man leading that was an Amalekite. So who are they? That's, there's an enmity that God set up against the Amalekites. And he took Saul out from being king because he did not kill them all. That's what the deal was. All right. This is Kristen who says, my brother has been dating a woman for about five years and they break up all the time. The relationship has been very toxic for him and it affects our family as a whole. He refuses to come around unless she comes. Is it wrong not to want a relationship with her and not to want to be around her? In my younger years, I dated people that my family didn't like, but I still went to see my family and didn't bring them out of courtesy for everyone. He's almost 50 and we've all prayed about this for years and it's separated him from us. What would you suggest? What I suggest is always you need to talk to people about things if you can and say, listen, this deal is, is really messing up our family. And with this woman, you really, if you really love her that much, get married to her. Otherwise, quit this on and on. And get a, there's something wrong. There's something a little bit wrong with that. Maybe they, they need some kind of counseling because obviously they, they they don't love each other enough to get married, and yet they love each other enough to, quote, have a relationship. 
And for the five years. Huh? For five years. For five years. And the fact that he insists on dragging her in. I'm thinking of, you remember Wallace Warfield Simpson, uh, who took away the king of England? It was, she was a divorcee. She was as mean as a snake and, and, you know, used to yell at him. And he, he it was just crazy. Uh, and the family, you know, didn't want her around. And you understand why not, all right? Okay, this is David who says, when Christ returns and those in Christ are called up, does that mean the spirits of the living or of the living and of the dead? If this means of the dead as well, where would their spirits be after death? I don't believe after death that the spirit is attached to the body anymore. But if it is, what happens to the spirit after a body is cremated and the ashes are scattered to the winds? Well, or for whatever reason, there are no physical remains of a body. Uh, you know, Jesus was praying for a girl who was dead. And, you know, he prayed, and the Bible says her spirit came back to her. The spirit is separate from the body. We have a body, and we have a spirit, and the two together make a soul. And the spirit is pneuma, the soul is so, I mean, the body is soma, and the, and the, the uh, uh, spirit is pneuma. Uh, the spirit is what lives on. And so when we die, the spirit leaves our body. And, you know, in that one case, the Bible says the spirit came back into her. So it had left and it came back. What, what happens when people, though, as they're saying, have been cremated or dead and their bodies are no longer well, there? What does it come back the to? The Lord recreates the body. He gives us a new body uh, at the resurrection. But the dead in Christ, the Bible says, will not precede or go ahead of those who are alive. But when the Lord comes, a shout of command, he'll come from heaven and he'll gather his elect from the four corners of the earth, the earth. And those who are living will be transformed and caught up to be with the Lord. But those who are dead will rise. And how do they rise? The spirits will come. The bodies, he's going to give them a brand new body so that that old body be like a, a grain of wheat that's dropped to the ground. It'll be, it'll be dead and gone. You know, I'm not into cremation. I know it's a lot cheaper, but I, I just don't like that. I think in the old days, they used to burn the bones of people they wanted to insult. And I think the idea of having a legitimate funeral is an important thing. But I know people are going for cremation because it's a whole lot cheaper. But cheap isn't necessarily what you want to do with your loved ones. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think what happens to that body, God is going to give new bodies to the spirits. The spirits are with the Lord. Remember the thief on the cross, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, his body wasn't with him in paradise. At least their bodies wouldn't be. Their spirits would be. All right. Well, that's all the time for today. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for those Thank questions. You. All right. Questions. Well, still ahead, student loan debt forces a military couple to face an impossible choice. It feels like a heavy burden. It just got to the point where it just, you either have to eat or like pay off student loans. See how this family receives an extreme blessing. That's coming up later. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Going to church can lead to longer, healthier lives. Timothy Carney, author of a new book called Alienated in America, says he found that people who practice their faith report better lives. For instance, people attending church more than once a week consider themselves very happy. Families that worship together are more likely to eat dinner together, as well as do things as a family. And people who worship at least weekly live longer. However, church attendance is declining. Pew reports only 36% of Americans attended weekly services in 2014. That's compared to a 1950s Gallup report of 49%. Well, CBN is supporting displaced people in Nigeria. Partnering with Viral Care, CBN held an event to help vulnerable children and others forced to flee their homes. More than 200 children heard the gospel and watched the Superbook program. Thanks to CBN International, families also left with new shoes, clothes, and food, as well as the hope of Jesus Christ. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. You know, uh, I'm pleased to 
report that CBN does a lot of things. Some of the time you don't hear about them. We have Operation Blessing that helps the poor, the needy, the dispossessed, those that don't need clothing and medicine and so forth. We do all around the world. We've helped hundreds of millions of people. We, of course, have the gospel. We, we have offerings, promise, and things that we do uh, with uh, Terry and her group. And one of the things that you're perhaps not aware of, we want to help the veterans who've come back to the home front, and we call it helping the home front. And so I want to introduce to you a couple, Jesse and Melissa. They're a military couple who were fighting a losing battle against student loan debts. And when their van broke down, they faced the prospect of even bigger bills until this wonderful couple got a visit from CBN's Helping the Home Front. Right outside Fort Bragg, North Carolina, you'll find E-4 Army soldier Jesse spending time with his wife, Melissa, and their four children. Melissa is grateful that Jesse makes family time a priority. I'm really proud of him, and I feel like he provides for our family, and he's serving our country, and so he's happy, and I'm happy. Jesse feels Melissa's job taking care of the kids is just as critical. I almost feel like she has a harder job, to be honest with you. Just having the, the mental strength like she does is incredible. When they got married, Melissa had finished college and intended to work to add to the family income. Their priorities changed as their family grew to six, and Melissa started homeschooling instead of pursuing a career. Through the years, Jesse's income alone couldn't keep up. Eventually, they were way behind on Melissa's student loan payments. It feels like a heavy burden. It would take forever to pay it off, basically. It just got to the point where it just, you either have to eat or like pay off student loans. To add to their money problems, they learned their family van required costly repairs. At the same time, they needed to buy beds for the twins, who'd outgrown their toddler beds. They'd have to put the expenses on a credit card. Through it all, the couple trusted that God would take care of them. God has done so many miracles in my life that there's no way that some way this isn't gonna work out. Their situation took a huge turn when their church, Riverhouse, contacted CBN's Helping the Home Front. Pastor Stacy Long invited the couple over to tell them that CBN was going to pay for the van repairs and buy beds for the twins. <laughs> you think the kids the will girls. be excited? Yeah, yeah they'll be excited. And there was another surprise. Another thing that Helping the Home Front <laughs> wants to do is they're going to pay off your student loan, so it goes away. <laughs> what do you guys think about that That's one? That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. I think I'm a little bit in shock. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I'm like, I don't know what to think. <laughs> I don't even know what to say, but I'm really thankful. It's absolutely amazing. CBN arranged to fix the van and then took them shopping to pick out beds for the twins. Now that Melissa's student loans are paid in full, the family can finally get ahead. I've been praying for a long time that somehow, some way that God would come through for us, and, and He has today with CBN. Now that's something you do when you're a 700 Club member. And you know, why should those people have to suffer? I mean, this man is giving his life to the armed forces. He may be called deployed overseas. He may be put in a place where uh, there's uh, active warfare. And why should he have to worry about the fact that he can't buy beds for his children or his van broke down? Well, we can't help them all, but that's one that we can help, and it's called opera. Helping the Home Front. That's one thing that CBN does. So when you join the 700 Club, you're doing all this. You're doing all this. Huge things. You're helping the poor and the needy and the suffering and those who need operations and those who maybe they have cataracts or they have some disfigurement. They've got all kinds of stuff. How do you do it? 65 cents a day, less than a half of a bottle of soda pop. We're talking about $20 a month, and you can be a 700 Club member. So please call right now, and I want to send you. This thing has really touched people because it has stirred faith. It's the I wills of God from Psalm 91, and it's something that I saw in there, and I, I did a teaching, and Scott and I were together, and, and I think we've got some testimonies of people who've been 
set free because of the power of God. Mm -hmm. You know, this is Dorothy. She lives in Oskaloosa, Iowa. And she says, she watched the DVD. She said, awesome work. I sent the I wills of God to my college grandson who suffers from anxiety. What, what a great thing to That's pass right. on. That's wonderful. Hope others are doing that with their copy as well. well. Pick up the telephone, folks. Call in your home. Uh, we got a holiday, but uh, holiday or no holiday, uh, just twenty dollars a month, sixty-five cents a day, and you can be, uh, you can change the lives of millions of people all over the world. So go to your phones, call in. It's one eight hundred seven hundred seven thousand. It's easy to remember. One eight hundred seven hundred seven thousand. Toll free. Uh, and here we are, and we just love to hear from you. Terry? Well, up next, a woman gets a shocking diagnosis from her doctor. She said, this is so rare and so aggressive. There's virtually no data on it. You have no time. Watch how she receives an out-of-the-box miracle after this. Plus, we're going to be praying for you and your needs, so stay with us. Marilee Koss knew she was sick, but she had no idea she was suffering from an extremely rare and highly aggressive cancer. Once she found out what she was facing, Marilee began to fight for her healing. And the result was what her doctor called an out-of-the-box miracle. I went to one doctor to hear about the biopsy reports. She said, this is so rare and so aggressive. There's virtually no data on it. You have no time. Marilee Koss knew the pain in her lower abdomen meant something was wrong. Now, while sitting in her doctor's office, the 67-year-old grandmother learned it was worse than she imagined. She had a rare, deadly cancer, and she would need radical surgery to remove it, along with part of her intestines. It's life-changing. Well, you'd end up wearing a permanent bag. The so cancer was already spreading. So they would have, I don't know what they would have done to my body. While still taking in the diagnosis, Marilee prayed. All I heard was our living God talk to me. Cancer's not yours to embrace. It's not yours to have. Do not take this. Don't embrace this. It's not yours to take. You're going to fight for your life. He kept saying, you're going to fight for your life. When she went for a second opinion, the doctor prescribed a rigorous, aggressive regimen of chemo and radiation. Marilee knew it was time to change her thinking about cancer. You know, when people say, I have cancer, well, I don't want to have cancer. You said, this is not, I changed my vocabulary. It's not ours to have. No disease is for us to have. He's delivered us. He finished it at the cross. He changed the way my, I spoke. This is not mine to keep. That's what he kept telling me. This is not yours to embrace. Do not take it in. You're going to fight for your life. She agreed to begin the treatment. Marilee also clung to God's promises in the Bible. She posted scriptures all over her house. And I printed out pages of healing and encouraging verses. I know that I was fenced in by massive prayer, and I never moved off of the word. You know, like Matthew 19, 26, what's impossible with man is possible with God. Praying for Marilee were friends and family from all over the world as the chemo and radiation took its toll. I couldn't barely walk after a while. I was so weak, and um, I just barely could just lay here on the couch because I just couldn't do much. Sometimes when the pain was so, so hard, I vigorously was quoting the scriptures out loud and commanding and putting a, a demand on the word, contending. All I can tell you is God carries us in the most difficult trials of our life. After seven months of treatment, Marilee went to the doctor for a checkup. And she said, I want to tell you something. There's no evidence of any tumor. There's no evidence of all the radiation. This is an out-of-the-box miracle. This is beyond anything she said I've ever seen in my life. No one can take credit for this except God. She said, if anyone was to examine you without seeing your reports, they would never, ever know that you had this and the treatment that you had. I was so thrilled to hear that news. Those are words that you, you never think you're going to hear. And but God stepped in. He's faithful. His word is faithful. His word is alive. Today, over five years later, Marilee is still cancer free. She knows it was the power of prayer that carried her through those dark days of chemo and radiation. I wouldn't be here without the power of prayer and without, without the word of God that's alive and active. I wouldn't be here. 
Never lose hope. Don't ever give up. Jesus is faithful. He's alive and he is real. I'm totally healed. God did a beautiful thing. God is able. He's so able. Let's pray right now for your needs as we have these last minutes Amen. together today. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just rebuke the devourer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, we say for those who are suffering today in this audience, we yes, will not Jesus. receive this sickness. Mm -hmm. We won't take it. It comes from the enemy and we will not receive it in the name of Jesus. Lord, bring marvelous healing to people right now. Reach down from heaven, Lord, and touch the lives of those of your people who are suffering in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Receive an answer. In the name of Jesus, be made whole. Terry, do you have anything? Yes, there's someone named Kelly. You've had a recent diagnosis. You have had such fear over this, but the same word that was given to the woman in that last story is given to you. Don't receive this. Do not own it. Do what you need to do to enhance your health, but you are going to be fine. Thank you, Lord. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. By his stripes, you are already healed. We speak Amen. that word. Receive it now in Jesus' name. Yes. Touch them. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Well, whew, wow. Today's power minute is from Psalm 91. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Tomorrow, the activist mommy, social media sensation Elizabeth Johnson joins us live on the 700 Club. And we'll look forward to having her with us. And we thank you for being with us today. And may the Lord bless all of you. Remember, if you need prayer, we have people at the telephones all day long. It's a toll-free number, and they'd love to pray for you, whatever the need is, to share your joy, to share your pain. So for all of us, this is Pat Robertson. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.